we can capture very fine textural features on the face, the wrinkles, the pores, all the blemishes that we naturally have. Tonight, computers hone in on our telltale features to tell us apart. This is very promising. Um, the ice sounds uh, very good, actually. Making music out of ice. Norway boasts the world's first ice musician and ice instrument maker. On the Alan Nursall experience, it's double the metal, double the fun. I heat things up with some metal on metal action. Then take a stunning flight through Saturn's rings. No CGI, no 3D models. This film is the real deal. Blowing your mind here on Daily Planet. Hello and welcome to Daily Planet. I'm Zai Tong. Jay is off tonight, which is too bad because Jay's a guy who can follow a beat. Now, I can do it, and you probably can too, but there is a man who is so bad at it that scientists are actually studying him. We're going to tell you all about his strange case later today. Also on the show, we've got new images of a Mars rover taken by a satellite orbiting the red planet, but up first, imaging of a different kind. The latest facial recognition technology from the global leaders in video surveillance, the Brits. I think it's hard to pick out a particular face in a crowd. Try getting a computer to do it well. And what we're trying to do is develop technology that's able to be more robust at recognizing a person's face. Say hello to the new face of recognition software set to change the way a computer sees you. If you think about the technology that's used at the moment, what tends to happen is that a 2D image is captured and then various features are measured. So, for example, the length of the nose, the distance between the eyes, and ratios are taken of those features and used to form a signature that can recognize a person. Melvin Smith's team is trying to overcome one big problem. If that person changes their expression or changes the pose, looks to one side, or even if the lighting changes, then those sorts of systems can fail. So together with colleagues at Imperial College London, they created PhotoFace, a system that gives computers a lot more to go on. We illuminate the face in different ways, using different lighting setups. There's a camera that shoots 500 frames a second. It's synchronized to four lights that go off in such quick succession, looks like a single flash. An ultrasound sensor triggers the whole thing. So I'm going to pass through now. Just like that. So just a simple stroll through, nothing particularly complicated there. And then what it's doing now is a little bit of processing to estimate my shape. And there you can see it's estimated my shape. And hopefully, there you go, it's recognized who I am, so it knows that I can pass through. PhotoFace takes four images, lit at different angles, and compiles them into one. So this is some four raw images of me that we captured before. And then we need to convert that to some sort of shape information. What it's showing is that the blue areas are at a grazing angle to the camera like that, and then the green areas are more parallel, and then red areas are that way. Uh, it's just a way of visualizing it. But essentially, what we have is the orientation of the skin at each point on the image. What it means is that we can capture very fine textual features on the face, the wrinkles, the pores, all the blemishes that we naturally have. We can capture all that detail. So in addition to capturing the shape of the face, we can also use those blemishes as a kind of signature to recognize someone. The system recognizes faces even under changing light. If we change the lighting conditions, it doesn't make any difference. If the sun's out, we can take that into consideration. That doesn't change the 3D shape. As long as we know where these raw images are from, the 3D shape of my face is constant. Could you just move slowly your lips? Across the hall, colleagues are working on a 4D system. It's a variation on PhotoFace using strobe lights instead. We are going to capture right, the face of somebody and then use that information to create 3D. But we'll do that in real time. They can look at the changing face any way they want. It allows us to have higher resolution information, so we could like zoom in parts of the face and have a closer look at it. That also opens up possibilities in biometrics, because we might be able to use the way in which a person smiles as a biometric. So, for example, the way in which you and I smile is probably subtly different, the way in which the smile develops across the face. So that in itself could be a useful biometric. Systems like this make it easier for security teams to identify a suspect in a crowd because they can alter the image on file for comparison. 
So the, the person you see in the crowd may be standing to one side, so their face isn't clear, and the lighting may not be ideal. So what you could do is take the model that you have of that person's face and then synthetically alter that model to match the face in the crowd. So you would alter the direction in which it is looking, alter the lighting that's applied to it, to make it as similar as possible to what you're actually seeing, and then look for a match. It could also be used by the movie biz. If you think of what you see at the cinema nowadays, it's very impressive. You go to see a 3D movie, it looks very realistic, but it's not interactive in any way. So if you move your head to one side, things don't change as they do in the real world. And also different people in different locations within the cinema would be able to see different things. So what we want to be able to do is capture something that's much more immersive and much more realistic. In the more immediate future, 4D imaging could change lives. So the idea is that we could have some technology like this that a general practitioner could use to capture a very accurate and very realistic description of a skin condition and then send that over the internet to a specialist in a remote location who could uh, interact with that in a, as though they were with the patient. But never fear, it's imaging that's almost, but not quite, as good as the real thing. Say cheese. Tomorrow, crashing a helicopter on purpose. We've all seen footage of crash tests on cars, but this is truly a sight to behold. Testing everything from shock-absorbing seats to airbags, that's tomorrow. Now, here at Daily Planet, we love featuring people who do things just a little differently, and the person you're about to meet is a perfect case in point. He's an experimental musician from Norway, and he produces music that is seriously cool. Central Norway. In the dead of winter, it's a cold and eerily silent place. But trapped deep within the ice, this man has uncovered a symphony of sound. <laughs> Teria Isangset is the world's first and most accomplished ice musician. As far as I know, uh, there are no other dealing with uh, ice music on, on this level, for sure. Tonight, he's playing a show for a crowd of over 200. Everything has to be perfect. It all starts with the ice. On a frozen lake near the town of Gilo, Teria's hunt for perfect ice is on. It all began back in 1999. He was asked to compose a concert on a frozen waterfall. For the show, he made a simple chime from the river's ice. Those first notes are still ringing in his ear. I think uh, I just thought uh, I have to continue this work. Uh, I can't stop. His quest to share that music with others is littered with obstacles. It's not just to go to a lake and find ice and start to play because it has to be uh, good ice. The best sounding ice is crystal clear, okay. as few air bubbles as possible. Even here at Teria's secret spot, it's a crapshoot. The sound quality changes from year to year. You can see there are some small air bubbles inside, but um, they are not too much, and it's it's uh, very very transparent and uh, clear. I think it will be good, but uh, with ice, you never know. <laughs> we won't know till we start making instruments, actually. At Teria's family farm early next morning, the fresh ice is ready to carve. It's really exciting for me to, to check it. How does it sound? He starts with a small cut into one of the blocks. This is very promising. Um, the ice sounds uh, very good, actually. The simplest ice instruments to build are percussion. Thin pieces that vibrate when hit. The colder the ice, the longer it vibrates. The longer it vibrates, the better the sound. I try to, to find the pieces of ice that can sing. This is okay. It's not perfect, but it's quite okay. Teria cuts and shaves the ice to change the pitch as needed. A smaller piece gives a higher note. Over the years, he's come up with some pretty cool designs. He's even challenged professional instrument builders to try their hand in ice. He's been accompanied by an ice fiddle, an ice harp, and even an ice guitar. The ice trumpet Terrier is carving today is one of the hardest instruments to master. 
they will never stay in tune uh, because when you blow the air the hole gets larger and uh, the tone will change and it's of course really limited what you can actually play on an instrument that you have never practiced and that actually melts when you play it it changes all the time on ice just hitting the same note twice is a challenge it's really hard work but when it works <laughs> it's worth it i think concert day in grong it's a small town about 10 hours north of gailo by car normally it's a perfect spot for an ice concert but not today the weather uh, i don't know the temperature I think it's still plus something. <laughs> As the sun drops, hopefully the temperature will follow. But that's ice music. You cannot control it. Terry has brought his ice instruments from Gailo inside a special freezer trailer. A small chunk of local ice has also been donated by the concert organizer. So I'm making a little drum. And I tune it down a little bit. So far, the ice is sounding fine, but the weather is taking a turn. You have to take everything down as quick as possible and put it in the freezer. It's four degrees and the instruments are melting. No rehearsal tonight, but the show must go on. As the crowd files in, Terria and his crew race to put the stage back together. A few final notes to check sound. Then, it's showtime. <laughs> Despite the weather, the concert drifts along from one dreamlike tune to the next. Even when an instrument breaks, Terria doesn't skip a beat. As usual, he gives the crowd a taste of his entire ice orchestra. Like a seasoned pro, he leaves them wanting more. It went surprisingly well, actually. <laughs> it was uh, amazing. It was fantastic. Never thought the uh, ice would sound so warm. Today it was really on the limit of what was possible. But when you start playing and you hear the sounds and hear that things works, then it's nice. It's good. Coming up on the Alan Nersal Experience, watch me turn heat into motion with a little heavy metal entertainment.